One. Three, two, one. Okay, we're, we're recording. <laughs> Hi, Keith. Good morning, Aaron. Third time lucky. So today we're going to... Okay. Sorry, say again. Third time lucky. Yeah. You start. <laughs> okay, so... <clears throat> The idea that um, language, no use of language and communication is a, a, a portal or a window into how someone thinks. And we can look at specifics. So the last video we did was on labeling, name calling, mm. and what that, what that suggests about uh, my internal thinking, if I, if I call someone a name, if I label someone. Uh, and I was thinking, what does all of this come under, under? And let's see if we can tease this out. So I'll give you uh, <clears throat> maybe a sentence, and um, I'd like to know what your response is. All of my communication and all, all of my use of language is manip manipulative. So there's a generalization there, isn't there? So my query would be all? Or I've yet to find an example where it's not. So at the moment, yes, it's a generalization. <clears throat> So give me an example of all of your communication is, what was the word again? Manipulative. Manipulative. Manipulative, yeah. So give me an example. Yeah. Just, just to make, just to be clear, I'm not using manipulative in a negative sense. No. What I'm saying is that all communication, all language that I use, the purpose of it is to manipulate or influence context to achieve my outcomes. It's interesting, <clears throat> isn't it? The word manipulative has um, generalizations attached to it too, doesn't it? It's, you know. Yeah. You know, because we, um, I, I, I kind of went into that. Um, the way from or the negative aspect of it, which is manipulating to get your own way. Having said that, you've also said, well, it's not necessarily doing that. However, you then say it's to get something to happen for you. And and yes. and I yeah, and ideally, language is really to communicate something so that something can be done or understood. Mm. And if I'm communicating to you, then I am wanting something. I'm wanting you to have the idea that I've got, or I'm wanting you to respond in a certain way, or I'm wanting you to disagree, or whatever it might be. So there is a, yes. is, there is, so that would mean, that would presuppose, wouldn't it, that there's got to be some level of manipulation in most communication. At the moment, I'm saying all, uh, because I want to know if there are uh, counterexamples. <laughs> At the moment, I'm using the generalization. Well, I guess the counterexamples, yeah, so, the, so the generalization means we also delete and distort other information to fit with the generalizations. So if I was going to ungeneralize it, I could, you know, I could maybe, re I could say is a thing so you're aware that you feel like you've been using language that manipulates others. And you feel that that's happening all the time. <clears throat> I 
if I can just offer a difference in, in the words you used, I, my experience is that I manipulate context. So to manipulate another person, I would literally need to hold them physically, do something to them physically. Oh, I'm, yes, because I missed that, didn't I? You said context. Yeah. So yeah, what I actually manipulate... thought was kind of weird. So what do you mean by that? What do you mean by you manipulating well, I'm, context? I'm doing it right now. So you and I are having a conversation. Yeah. And I could manipulate this context by being completely silent. In other words, I'm, I'm adding information or what's perceived, what could be perceived as a lack of information in silence. I am influencing what's happening between you and I in the, at this point in time. I'm adding information that wasn't there before. And that's what I mean by manipulating. I would have to be completely <laughs> gone to not in manipulate this context, to not influence this context. So manipulate and influence are synonymous. So, it, and this is the curious thing for me. So you and I are having a conversation and if my generalization is in any way accurate, my purpose is, as you said, to act, to have you take on something that I'm thinking, or to have you challenge it, or to have you just think about it. So that's what I mean by manipulate, to influence, and. <clears throat> It's a little bit shocking to become aware <laughs> mm. that that's how come. How come? Mm. When I've not been aware of my purposes, what it is I'm actually after, I've well, there have been many occasions where you know I just blurt out, or I try to defend something that I think needs defending, an idea, yes. uh, a way of thinking, um, the way the world should be. And the state of mind that I've gone into is, is usually, usually pretty much the same. It's the, I, I blurt out, I have to say something, I have to challenge someone, I have to contra contradict someone. Um, and there are occasions when I agree with someone. The, the ones I'm fascinated with are, are when I, I'm compelled to try and convince someone otherwise of what they're thinking and try to get them, try to influence them to take on what I'm thinking. And, and what came to me was the question, well, what on earth am I defending? What what could possibly go wrong if someone else thinks differently to me? So the state of mind is one of defence, being defensive, um, and that those sensations then compel me to be on the offensive. So the person across from me has to think what I think. And I'll do everything, you know, I'll, I'll bludgeon them in any way possible with language, with communication, take on my point of view. And uh, just historically, the number of times I've done it, just shocking. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so what's also running with this generalization is a feeling that, that this just do, that doesn't feel good as well. Yeah. Uh, so I had to explore it. <clears throat> Didn't have to. I was keen to explore it. And... There was this sense of, I have to defend my, my stance. I have to defend what I think is right and correct. And and, and then I thought, well, what's behind that? You know, there's a sense, you know, what does it matter if someone thinks differently? And that there's really strong physical sensations that something's wrong. If someone is thinking differently to me, there's a very strong physical sensation that something's going to happen to me because someone else thinks differently to me. 
So I have to defend that. And I'm so you you you're talking about your beliefs, aren't you? You're talking about you. So the example would be is like I believe that this is true. Yeah. So one possibility is I believe that this is true, and they are challenging that. And mm. I think the interesting thing that comes to mind straight away is that we have um, we structure our life, our thoughts, our behaviours, our conversations, our relationships around what we think is true. And so much of what we do, how we live our life, is based on that. It's the f mm. foundation of our, our safety. So our safety is, has a lot to, or perceived safety, has a lot to do with our mm. beliefs, what we think is true. So someone comes along and says, well, you know, the earth is actually flat, buddy. Then, you know, you're going to start going, oh, I never thought of that because when I'm standing on the beach and I stick a ruler, you know, a long ruler, my God, that horizon is actually flat, you know. Mm. Um, um, and, and, but wait a minute. So, so my sense of security and safety is challenged because I've lived my whole life with that structure of, or, or state of, of existence. And I mm -hmm. think that's, that's, does that resonate? Like there's a sense that you're, that there's, that, that, that you're not feeling safe. And so there's a, almost a flight or oh, fight so, or there's yeah. a visceral. Yeah. Certainly not. The, the sense of safety is is being challenged. Yeah. Which I find intriguing. What what, how, what do I need to be feel to feel safe? Um, and it could be anything. Like as you say, if someone comes on and says the Earth is actually flat, and if someone did that to me, I would get that physical sensation because I've I've invested so much in the Earth being a sphere. <laughs> it's like yeah, really that's that's such a worry that someone's going to come along. And say the earth is well, they're flat. doing it daily, mate. Go on YouTube and they're <laughs> <I know. laughs> doing it daily. And yet, the, the, the physical <laughs> sensation flat, is so real. Flat. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so, so that is interesting because what also, when I think about something that is so, so if I give an example, um, yeah, no, 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 I don't need to. So, so, um, what immediately comes to mind is. When we go into that that fear for our safety in mm. a changing belief structure, then what we're then aware of is something is in jeopardy with respect to our potential future. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And what what then comes to mind is, well, okay, well, where is that for me? And my first instance was I pointed over there. So my job then is on a structural level is to go, okay, so what I need to reduce this flight or fight so that I can actually be in an open state of curiosity and, and able to say yes to potential possibility is I can picture myself at the end of this conversation, smiling because I'm still alive. <laughs> Think about it, man. Some people, when they go into these, like when they get into a political argument, or they look like they're going, they look like their their life is threatened. Now, if you think about yes. taking that to the next level, which is nationalism, religiousism. Lupialism, whatever you want to call it, you know, the earth is freaking flat, buddy. You know, and I've got an AK whatever in the in the whatever, then then what that's gonna mean is that you know, so that's that's the extreme version, but what we're talking about here is is how am I structuring or able to structure my world that which I'm in control of so that I can potentially be open to a difference of idea. Mm. And the only way to do that is That's I have to think about what yeah. yeah. And and and, yeah, and maybe do. so if so if I said to you, if you went back to a time just before that happened, like when you were being 
questioned or you were in that you're about you know historically you're about to enter that place where you're going to be confronted manipulated by someone else's idea of the world happens all the time <laughs> like this the morning <laughs> <laughs> yeah. happens all the no, time I haven't bumped into anyone yet <laughs> so so does it happen while you're asleep while I'm asleep yeah god that's that's a whole other topic I'm I'm fascinated by dreams and we can actually Scared the living day. Let's have Conscious, <laughs> con Consciously, are you aware that it's happening while you're asleep? No. When else isn't it happening? Isn't it happening? Yeah. When else isn't it happening? <sighs> when else are you not manipulating someone with, or context, sorry, with your behavior? Where else aren't you? Uh, the only time is when I'm not around other people. Yeah, but when you're alone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And yeah, if I can play so you're... scenarios in my thinking on my own. Yeah. I guess it's like and yet, an anxiety are they, strategy to prepare, they can... prepare for the future. Yeah, so are they contextual or are they... Yeah, uh, yeah it's still manipulating context. It's still the use of language. It's still communicating something. I've got to, I've got to get this point across. We've got to make them see. Uh, it's it's a fascinating. Yeah, the, the, if if there are two aspects to ourselves, one aspect sees the larger context and sees the relationship, and the other aspect is very focused on specific. What is that part uh, of you want that, that that's doing this? Sorry to interrupt, but like, what what is that part of you wanting fine. by? What do you want? He wants the world to be the way I want it to be. And if it is the way you want it to be, what does this part get out of that that's more important? Just it's a sense of ease, calm. Right. Mm. So if if that part of you looks at the strategy trying to get other come to your world so that you can have the kind of world that you want that will then hopefully lead to a sense of peace and calm. How often mm. has this behaviour led to peace and calm? Uh, I can't think of a time when it has mm. at this point in time. What I can recall <clears throat> it hasn't led to peace and calm. It's actually led to in myself a sense of What, hang on. The word militant came to mind straight away. So wanting to attack. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so this part didn't of you be, ha has... Didn't bring me peace and calm. <laughs> no. So has to... this... Well, okay. well, <laughs> yeah, military act actions seldom do. So if you if you if this part of you was to look back over time and recognize that actually its strategy its process has never actually led to the highest intention has it actually mm -hmm. has it done that yet has it like is it can it do that recognize that yeah yes oh yes yes does it well, does it want to well, it's re it's a relative relatively recent awareness <laughs> Yeah. So does it so does it want to continue doing a behaviour that cannot get it what it actually wants and needs? Well, in in, in a way, yes, because it feels yeah. good. Yeah. 
Um, so we need to check that. You know, though, if, if, I can, feel good. if I can make fists, if I can make fists and metaphorically, you know, take people out who are not yeah. fitting into the way I want things to be, yeah, that feels good. For how long does it feel good? Uh, sometimes a bit too long. I do eventually catch myself. No, well, I do. I know, knowing that I'm, I, I rile myself up. Like it's, it's like an adrenaline fix. Yeah. If I can do these, if I can do that and get in, um, adrenaline pumping, it's such a good feeling. And then I realize that that's what I'm doing. <clears throat> And I'm fantasizing scenarios where I can take control. Mm. And that's when I stand back and recognize, oh, that's what I'm doing. Is that going to get me what I want? You know, what if I really could control people? Is that really what I want? So I do eventually step back and calm myself down. So it's a wonderful adrenaline hit there. <laughs> mm. Quite a big well, it is. I'm fascinated by um, <clears throat> superhero stories and movies. Mm. Such an adrenaline hit. All it, all it takes is a fist and a punch, and you've solved the world's problems. Or even your own problems. You know, you're invincible. So it's that sort of feeling. It's really cool. <laughs> but eventually, I do, know how, I do know to step back. <laughs> so at a higher level, though, at a higher level of a logical level or intention, there's, there is the awareness, however, that it doesn't actually, short, medium, long term, actually generate peace or a sense of calm. No. And, and in the retrospective view, looking back, it generally creates more discord, possibly guilt, those sorts of negative Death, emotions. Definitely discord. Definitely discord. It's like, you know, I'm... This militant sort of thinking is very aggressive sort of thinking, and it's only occurring in my thinking. It actually hasn't changed the, those contexts that have, have challenged my sense of safety. So when I do step back, I can calm things down in a way, but it's not, it's not the calm and peace that I'm after. Which no, no, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be because no. it's it's not actually part of the original strategy. The original strategy doesn't lead straight away to what it actually. So, um, does do your your understanding is that all learning is is your unconscious? All learning. Yeah. So all learning is an it's unconscious It's a generalization, but, but I am. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's a good generalization. Generally, it fits. So, your and in this case, probably quite useful. So, <laughs> that would suggest that this aspect or this behavior was learned unconsciously. And Possibly. we don't need to necessarily the other, the other go in. I think. No, I think that there's an aspect an aspect of that. Um, if the research is anything to go go by, it could also be part of um, my neurology. One as one aspect of me is focused um, on specifics. Is predominantly about um, utilization, using the world around me. <clears throat> Another aspect of me is about um, relationships and and learning and being surprised. So uh, it's quite possible that both are function. I can learn mm -hmm. these behaviours, and they can also be intrinsic. So that, that's intriguing as well. Mm. Sorry, go on. <laughs> Did I hit you? In the end, do you find yourself reflecting either during as it's happening or after it's happened mm. because generally it's a triggered response yes yeah so yeah. generally a triggered response has become an unconscious pattern yeah which is amazing okay. i can eventually i will eventually recognize that i'm doing it 
that's 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 what I was kind of meaning by the unconscious learning aspect. So, yeah. so yeah, and and what we know also, you know, nature nurture, all that sort of stuff is, you know, the ongoing conversation is that, you know, what also, you know, if if behaviour wires together long enough, it becomes neurological wiring. You know, if you know walking is neurological wiring, before you could walk, you didn't have the wiring, but you saw it contextually. You needed to do it, and, so, and then suddenly you build the wiring. Everything we do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, would your unconscious mind have any objection to considering that the same triggers could trigger you, trigger you into a behaviour that generates peace and calm? Is there any objection from your unconscious considering that that might be something that's potentially available to you? Wait, is there an objection? Yeah. And you could successfully resist any temptation to consider that there is an objection simply because it would not make any logical oh, I was, sense. I was going to, to resist. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I was, and I was yet, going to resist. Yeah. And yet that would be. A, I thought. That, that would be a conscious resistance because of the addictive mm. nature. And yet unconsciously it would be, you know, more healthy to resist any temptation to resist the mm. idea mm. simply because. Yeah. yeah I will. I was going to resist it. When you, as you were asking the question, I was going to go, no, I want the peace and calm. I thought, wait a second. Yeah, you, so yeah. I went into it. That's, that's the end result, yes. So the objection was, I want to be acknowledged first before we go. And I, and I think um, we've acknowledged this strategy, and I think we've acknowledged its history, and mm. I think we've also acknowledged a, a much more important part for your unconscious operating kind of process, which is that it doesn't work. And not not to get me to peace and calm. No. <laughs> exactly. It's you know when you when you grab the chair leg to learn to walk, you know. There was an unconscious awareness because of what you're seeing around you that the higher intention could be met. Mm. So somewhere in your past, there was possibly an awareness that's by by seeing, hearing, feeling, whatever, you possibly saw an outcome that you interpreted as a successful outcome because of the behaviour that you were witnessing, and mm. logged that, tried it out a few times, and realised that it had some usefulness, and yet. It didn't necessarily have the usefulness that you thought or perceived it actually did in the first instance. And that's generally how we kind of go about these things. So when you get your balance on the bike for the first time, you know, you kind of once you nail that, that's that's it. But you can see other people fall over. You can see people skin their knees. But you, damn it, still going to do it. Yeah. Uh, well. This, the strategy has never taken me directly to peace and calm, which is interesting. So it hasn't worked in that sense. It hasn't. I, I don't think I can recall at this point in time that it's actually taken me to what I really wanted, which was peace and calm. Yeah. Uh, in general, it took me to this mm, this anger, this you know, wanting to make a fist, this adrenaline hit. So in that sense, it worked really well. <laughs> Because yeah, but for a different reason. Yeah, for oh, a different yeah, outcome. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering, would would your unconscious mind consider that there could be contexts where you could consciously engage in that kind of behaviour in order to experience what you need from that kind of experience? the adrenaline, the clenching, the mm. frustration or anger, whatever it might be, and yet you're defining that now. I'm doing what? What was that last bit? I'm you're defining that now. Defining. Defining that now. Refining. Defining that Defining, now. yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, we must. We've got a dodgy. We are we are talking across the ditch between Australia and New Zealand, and so that would suggest that we have. And, and Sydney has the shittiest internet, I think, because we just constantly have problems. <laughs> but I digress. I just generalised, of course. <laughs> 
<laughs> so can we just can we just go back? So yes, we can have a discussion about the 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 stru structure of the strategy and the reasons for the strategy that we don't want. And yet the conversation we're actually having has been born out of a generalization that um, was one that you have historically felt uncomfortable with. And so the essence of it is is does your unconscious mind have any dis does it have any objection whatsoever to considering that there are new strategies that are available to you that it can start to practice unconsciously and consciously that will bring you to states of peace and calm? Yeah, there's not a, it's not so much an objection, it's the, the idea is the thing that comes before the peace and calm is the, the acknowledgement that I, I feel threatened and that's fine. Okay, so from that feeling of threatened, we can go to peace and calm. And in that state of peace and calm, then I can influence the context in far more effective ways so, so my career would then be I'm, I'm hearing you so you could so you could become aware consciously of the feeling of threatened and then st structurally there's some strategies already beginning to appear that will allow you to drop into a, a state of peace and calm that will allow you then to be able to, as you put it, manipulate the situation um, in ways that... Okay, so if we just step back one or two and we went back to... So I have a question, how do you go about feeling threatened? How do you do that? Mm -hmm. When, when I've heard or seen things that conflict with what I think is right or correct, I immediately get this sens the sensations that I'm um, of fear that um, I'm under attack. Yeah, and if you and were they might not aware, even be trying to attack me. Yeah. <laughs> of course. And if you were aware that there is potentially a mental kind of construct to this feeling of being attacked, and that mental construct was some kind of mental picture, what might mm -hmm. that be? What would the picture be? Yeah, what might it be? Like, would it be a movie? Would it be a still? So what, what occurred straight away was I'm, I'm looking through my eyes, I'm, I'm in my body, and I'm... Almost like being pushed back or drawn back into some sort of funnel. Mm -hmm. So, so it's a movie. Uh, it's kind of like a a, a, a movie of, process, like it's moving. Sort of. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's moving, and my peripheral vision is gone. It's just, yep. it's it's sort of blurry and and, and grey, and it's just I'm being sucked back or pushed back from this immediate threat in front of me. Yeah. So you've been sucked back or pushed back. This is all great. Is it colour or black and white in front of you? Grey, colour or black colour. and white? Colour. Colour. And it's, and it's kind of sort of moving, so it's a sense of movement to it that you're being pushed. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming back, being pushed, and then yeah. that's coming towards me. And I notice that funnel's pretty narrow. So um, would it feel the same yeah. <laughs> if, if it was a static image 
like no movement, just static. We feel the same. Yeah, it's different. In what way? It's different. Um, does it, is it increase or decrease in the feeling of discomfort from it? Decreases. As soon as I take movement out of it, you know, the feeling, the unpleasant sensation decreases. Okay. And, and then if you took the colour out of it, just to check what that does as well, what happens then? Oh, okay. You turn it to black and white. The, the unpleasant sensation increases. Right. So if we put it back to colour. Yep. So it's static, but what we do is we maybe, if we can, I don't know how you, you can do this, is, you know, maybe push those narrow blurry bits out so that you can see more of the peripheral in colour. Static still, mm -hmm. but colour, peripheral. Yeah, what happens yeah. to the feeling then? It's better. Yeah. Feels better. Manageable. No, it feels better. Yeah. Oh, better. Yep. So, if better is on a scale and peace and calm are part of that scale, where is better and where is peace and calm? Whoa. They're all they're all part of the same scale, zero to ten. Ten being peace and calm, let's say. And where's so where's better? Oh, it's moving. It's moving towards it. It's two, th two or three. From a zero. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, yeah. if you were to, if you were to kind of take this static image and just push it away a little bit, so that as you push it away, you get kind of more of an awareness of the peripheral. You also get aware that there's a distance between you and whatever's been pushing you. What happens then to the to the better? Mm. It reduces. Meaning it gets less better. Yeah, interesting, eh? So if you were to bring it back again to where it's better, mm -hmm. and no, noticing that we can do certain things to manipulate this picture, it could be size, it could be shape, it could be anything, I want you to just, just play with it a little bit until you get a sense that you can move it from better to better than better. I'm really interested in how that works. Would you maybe increase the the colour saturation a little bit, or would you increase the brightness or decrease the brightness, or what? What can you do so that you get a sense that? You... What came to mind straight away is I I stepped out of myself and and saw myself next to me. Yeah. And and, so and how much closer to better does that be? Yeah, how much closer up the scale uh, to peace? I could feel the scale moving up. I can feel it. Yeah, nice. I could feel it moving up from three if I could step yeah. out and see myself in the situation. It started yeah. going up. So feeling better nice. increased. So if we, so so we step out to the it. point. But okay, I'll do that. Yeah, nice. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's, that's really. It's interesting because. I often wonder how how the because I've, I've noticed this happen so many times with with people doing this kind of work is that there will often be a point where they step out from a first person, and I think we've discussed this in the past where there's a natural desire to have an ecology around any decision making we make, and a first person only decision which is unconsciously driven by a pattern is generally not ecological. Mm. No matter just whether it's for a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a singular perspective from the first person. There's no ecology. And what I mean by that is, for those who've never heard this before, is an ecological view is to look at it from the first person, a second person perspective, and then a third, almost, you know, third person, almost environmental view like a fly on the wall looking at it, a bird on a tree looking at it, you know, the grass on the ground looking at it. So it's kind of like an ecological. And then when those check, the three, then we have an ecological. And it's very challenging to do because we're not taught to it, and it can take time. But if you're dealing with a major thing like this, which is a major thing, because you're talking about 
Because what this has all been about is a generalization around all of my conversations with context are manipulative. <laughs> so I hope I got that right. And what that's come out of is what come, that's come down to is actually an unconscious trigger that is triggered spontaneously by the context saying, I'm fucking not with you, mate. Don't agree with you. And, and that triggers what has been an unconscious drop into a very narrow funnel of I'm being challenged, I could die. And that's the reptilian brain functioning there going. I could die. And that's why earlier on I talked about a timeline where in the future, we can. I'm looking at my future, I can see myself at the end of this going, yeah, all good, I'm still alive. So your brain goes, oh, I'm not going to die, we can relax. But in this instance, you've been running something else. And what we're doing there is we've chunked a generalization. NLP talk chunked a generalization all the way down into what is the structure of the triggered response that's possibly been there for a significant amount of your life, generalizing, of mm -hmm. course, but that's often mm -hmm. how this works. And we don't need to know, you know, we don't need to know where it comes from, but that can often appear later on because by ungluing all of this, pulling it apart and deconstructing it, the brain starts to just loosen everything. And that includes the memories around where it potentially came from. And there's no blame there. It's just more fascinating than ever where it came from. So so what I want you to do now, so, so we've, we've had a nice little distraction there. But what I want you to do now is I want you to just go into, if you could just, just pop inside for a moment, Mm -hmm. and just go into a time in the past where you know you did respond in that old structural strat strategic way where you went into the feeling attacked, being sucked in, all that sort of stuff. And in this past time, I want you to notice immediately what is different, what is even just subtly different in your internal and, and behavioral response. Let's go with it. Yeah, what's there? What's, what's going on there? I just got a sensation in my in my chest. You got some what in your chest? Chest. Uh, a sensation. Get a sensation. And that. And what's the sensation? <clears throat> it's it's a communication that. Um, What I'm experiencing is different to my own expectation. So, and, and what's that like? Mm -hmm. So, what is that like? This behaviour that's different to your expectation. In terms of the sensation in my chest, or yeah, how it feels. What's it like? Someone's trying to warn me that this thing is different. And in this case, the difference is it is an unpleasant thing, it's a bad thing. So it's like a warning. Is that different? Oh, yeah. Hmm. yeah because what happens next? I'm not lost in it straight away. It's, oh, I get it. And I'm not in it. It's like, oh, great, thank you. And... I'm not lost. I haven't got, I haven't sort of found myself in oh, this immediate sense of fear and wanting to tell you. And so, it's just, oh, so, yeah, yeah. so when you don't have that immediate sensation that you've been used to, what happens next that is different in this imaginary uh, scenario? Yeah, yeah. I get the sense that I can step back immediately. And and that gives you what what does that give you? Me, gives me space. Gives me a chance to breathe. 
rather than being constricted in my breathing, in a worried sense. Um, yeah, there's a breathing change. I can step back, I can take my time, and I can breathe. I can recognize the difference. The, it, it's someone else's difference. There's yeah. not a sense that it's okay yet, but it's, there is a sense that I can step back and, and, and assess it. And when you step back and assess it, how much easier is it for you to connect with your logical awareness that you'll survive this? Because you always have. That's the interesting thing. You've, no matter what the behavior mm. was in the past, you've always survived it. So if you were to yeah. take that knowledge and as you step back, you present an image to yourself of you, of you at the other end of this conversation, just smiling because you survived it. Mm. Mm. Is that useful? Oh, that is, yeah. If I, if I can see myself at the end of, of an, an experience, um, a live and smile, I can see my Yeah. And it's very, really, very important to, to say that it's you're smiling not because you won or because you're right, you're smiling because you survived this. It's, it's just a deep reptilian kind of brain sort of reassurance strategy yeah. so it's not that you got it right I, I survived the... i survived i'm smiling and, and i didn't need to i didn't need to try and push someone in, in, a, in a direction that i wanted them to go yeah and i, and I still survived <laughs> yeah so if you were to just stop there for a moment and then and just go inside again and slip on out into your future and slip onto a future time or place, the kind of time or place where you know in the recent past you would have slipped into that old behavior. And yet in this new future time and place, similar kind of context, you'll notice immediately that something's different and you're able to do different things. And just notice what that's like straight away. Yep. Yeah. And notice that you have choices. So you could, at any point in this future time and place, you could choose to just behave in the old way. Mm. And notice what happens when you kind of have, give that a go now. So what comes to mind is I'm... I'm moving rapidly out of myself, observing myself back in and, and moving out again, but in a different direction, a different part of the room, continually going in and out. Um, and what that's doing for me is I'm not staying static in, in one way, um, use the word perspective. I'm not stuck in one perspective. I'm, I'm, it's a funny sensation of moving out different places and coming back to myself. Okay. So it's like a, a physical jostle to make sure I'm not stuck in the one physiology. Yeah. And yet I'm not moving. It's all it's all a mental process of imagining. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> yeah. I can always come back yeah. to my physical self. Yeah. So you're getting perspective on a situation really quickly. Well, I'm, I'm getting away from the single perspective. So, yeah. yes, I'm, I'm getting perspective, but it's spontaneously popping out of just mm, seeing things one way. It's continually moving yeah. in and out, in and out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go inside again and stay in this future time place where we're just playing with this idea, and you were to consider an old generalization that you used to have about manipulating and notice what has potentially changed with regards to that, the language around that generalization. What comes to mind straight away? 
what comes to mind straight away is that I can I can manipulate you far better. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, yeah. Always I can use other words. I can I can influence the context far better. Right. Than being constrained to wanting to influence through fear. I can influence from other states. What happens to if you were doing ecology on the other person's ability to influence you? What happens to your receptivity to their influence? Or the let's say the context's influence. Good question. Mm. Yeah. What do you notice? Well, I, I I popped into their perspective. I popped into their body. Yep. That was yep. that was interesting. That was interesting for me. Obviously, my hallucina hallucination for popping into their body was like a sense of, <clears throat> I've got to tell you this and I've got to convince you of this. Okay. So I popped out. Excuse me. Went back into myself and started doing this, this jostling. And the sense is that that's great. You can influence me all you want. And, and I might get a lot out of that. I might get new information that I hadn't considered before. So it felt okay as long as I could do the jostling. It doesn't feel like I'm being threatened. It doesn't feel like I'm. So if, yeah, yeah. So if you're if you if your unconscious mind was a it was um, instructed to go back at its leisure and play with all past experiences where you used to run that old strategy and was given the instruction to implant this new strategy until it's kind of nailed nailed it. Um, Is there any objection to that? Um, no. And um, it can test as it goes. Yeah, and it can test as it goes to make sure. Because we're not changing history. What we're doing is we're wanting to learn from it and learn that we history can give us more choices. History is so useful because we can implant new strategies into old context and notice what happens. And that can become mm. part of your learning now. Oh. Yeah. And that means, that's right, you can... You can begin to notice how surprising it is with regards to how quickly you, you learn new stuff. Which would be nice. Well, it's interesting because what you'll notice is you could probably flick back to a time in the more recent or not so recent past where you know you did succumb to that old behavior and notice that as you flick back to it right now, it already looks and feels different. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. And for the viewer, that's pr pretty much because the neurological structure is the same regardless of when it happened because the neurological structure that we've already shifted, that Keith has shifted successfully, where he's implanted more choices, was the same neurological structure whether he was 4, 5, 10, 20, 30 years old. It doesn't matter. And so by changing it in the present, we've changed it all the way back. Mm. Yeah. And so that also means that, which is kind of fun, is the genetic, epigenetic response back through time, we now know, will also influence in a positive way and give your body more choices about how it views your past, which mm. means your biological age has just changed. <laughs> and it's really cool because that's how the epigenetic, because you were saying the conversation through language with your context, and what we know is this, and this has been proven in recent research, is that when you change your perception of past context, 
context, and we know that past stressors create aging. And you change those past experiences to create more choices, which gives us more freedom and reduces stress. That means your biological age reduces. It's really fascinating. Some great research. research I'm, I'm interested. <laughs> Yeah, no, so, um, there's a couple of research studies. I was just given one, but I, I read it a couple of years ago, but it's um, some hotel cleaners. But the, the interesting summary research, which they couldn't quite work out, but um, was kind of picked apart by some, um, I guess, psychology, NLP sort of minds, was that, that an epigenetic people. They were basically just doing a, a study on um, what two groups of hotel cleaners um, what happened to their health markers, you know, um, blood pressure, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. They were both doing exactly the same work, but they were told completely different stories. They were both, both were given exactly the same um, tests, but told completely different stories about their tests. So the whole thing was based on their perception of what they were being told about what they were doing. And the whole idea, the whole thing is around, you're doing eight hours of nonstop exercise as a cleaner, and that means you're actually getting healthier. Very little truth to it, but fundamentally, what happened was the group that were told that it was healthy for them were getting healthier. Their BMIs were coming down, heart, heart pressure, blood pressure, everything, they're becoming fitter. The guys were told that Actually, wait a minute. We're a bit concerned about blood pressure. They were their health was getting worse, and they were getting stressed and everything. This went on for six weeks. So then, at the end of the six weeks, they gave them the list of blah blah blah, and then they asked them to do a psychological kind of feedback on specific questions about how they found the research study. They would give treated the same researchers, white lab coat, same context, everything was exactly the same except the information they were given back. So the people who were told that they were doing great and it ends up they were, they they in the end said, oh mate, this, this is the best time I've had it for years. I never thought work could be so good. You guys were so nice to us, felt blah, blah, blah. Their biological age had dropped. Mm. Guys over here who, they, oh my God, this was just such a waste of time. You guys were so horrible to us. You didn't help us very much. Work just stayed to be shit. Their biological age increased. <laughs> and it was all lies. <laughs> and it didn't matter whether it was true or not. It didn't matter. It was just, it was like the absolute, and they've peer reviewed it and they've peer checked it. So they've done it again a couple of times. It's such an easy piece of research to do as long as you get, you know, mm. and it's so easy to get. Um, and, um, yeah, and, um, you know, long and short of it. But the interesting thing was the biological age conversation, which was when you perceive that your experience has been wonderful and great, your biological age drops, meaning you get younger. Mm. So the average age was whatever. So they, on average, they were two to five years younger biologically. Yeah. Interesting. So fascinating. And so what I get out of that with NLP and, and hypnosis and all these sort of psychotherapeutic things that work at a subconscious level is that when we're working at that subconscious level and we check and test for how we're remembering those past experiences and we notice there's more freedom, well, we know epigenetically that that means we've reduced the stress associated with all those experiences, which means that the biological age has dropped away from it. Mm -hmm. So it means we can look back and we're detached, we're dissociated or whatever, and we look back and it's nice and comfortable. It's like, oh, it's not a big deal. I've got more choices, yada, yada. And so the whole body goes, oh, fuck, I feel more at peace and I feel more calm. <laughs> Don't you, Keith? <laughs> <laughs> so with respect to that conversation, Ooh. which is 59 minutes, it was going to be another 15-minute go. I think I know. <laughs> yeah, wow. Crazy. So do you, want to talk to, do you want to talk to your experience slash response slash what, what, how does this relate to what we started out with, was, which was a, a, a nicely put generalization around um, manipulating others? 
So how do you feel about that generalization right now, if you could speak to that? Does it make sense anymore? Does it resonate anymore? Oh, it's opened up possibilities. Um, yeah, it's opened up possibilities. It, it, it comes it comes back to the research that you just um, talked about. You know, a lie was given to two, two, you know, two different lies were given to two different groups. Yeah. And how did they take it on board? So <laughs> the myths that we live with, Keith. The myths yes. that we live with. I mean, we're living with some yeah. extraordinary myths. In this 21st century place where we're anywhere saying five to 20 years from an apocalyptic transition. Apocalypse means transition, not end, by the way. I mean, it's like, you know, it's, it's seriously, we're, being, we're confronted with this daily. It's either financial, environmental, all of it, you know. Yeah. And, and what does that do, you know, when we take it on and we can't control it? You know, and, and that's, we generalize. We're, we're seeing colossal generalizations in our culture at the moment. Exactly, yes. As you said, and, if, we gen if we generalize, we'll also delete and distort. Um, so if we generalize, we will choose to focus on this and we will negate anything that contradicts that so it comes that the generalization it then becomes the truth but it's not it's yeah it just means i like also can i just to, yeah. yeah can i also point out that your funnel is over there now <laughs> can I notice you? your funnel seems to be over there which i kind of like but i mean you're so right because generates a found view of reality I remember talking to a very dear friend of my parents. He was a doctor, and he was studying ear, nose, and throat. And I remember I um, I had asthma at the time, and I was dealing. And Mum said, oh, "I'll talk to David," and it was the same. And David said, "I don't know because I don't work in that area." And I was thinking, "Wait a minute, it's like ear, nose, and th oh, that's right, you're an ear, nose, and throat doctor." Seriously, he spent hours a day, re, you know, in studying for his exams, studying to do the operation study. It was like non-stop because the explosion of information around what they're learning about and everything, he, it's like all, and couldn't even think about another part of the body. So I'm thinking, you know, as a metaphor to what we're dealing with, in our just the environment if we narrowly focus on one part of the story and that becomes the story then we we kind of without knowing and without you know not incorrectly but certainly not necessarily um usefully we negate <laughs> the rest of the environment and the rest of the other things that are potentially affecting um what's going on and I and 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 that's generalizations deletions distortions and 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 what you how your brain functioned in that triggered moment was whoosh, like that it, it sucked mm. funnel and nothing's mm. available there now that's that's where you go into flight or fight freeze fly or fight and that's what we know animal reptilian response is I've got to fight or I've got to find a way to run and flight. And it's like, but we freeze first. Ultimately, the freeze is now with more choices. It's going to be, wait a minute. You know. Yeah, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. And then maybe jump out, jump out, jump out, jump out. Come back in. Nah, it's all good. Da, 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 da. Mm. You know? Sorry, too much talking there, but it's just, it's fascinating. So for whoever's watching this, you know, um, drop us a comment or email us. I think it's in the bio. You know, and just email us if you have any questions about 
these sorts of things. And if you want to understand the strategies more, drop us an email and we'll make a video about more of it. And we'll try to keep it at an hour. <laughs> or less. <laughs> or less. <laughs> I think what also we want to, we want to say is um, we're, Keith and I have discussed this, we're, Keith and I have been talking with each other for over seven years, I think, actually much longer, than almost the age of my daughter, which would be 13 years, I think, when I found you after the experience at Placemakers on Waiheke Island. So, and, and so we've been talking at length about these things for a long time, and I think we have had growth and, and evolution of what we're talking about. Um, I was going to say, so some of these concepts are, can be quite challenging, and we both have come from it from all come at it when we first met from already doing a lot of work on it. So when I was working with Keith and vice versa, but I was really working with Keith in the situation, um, that's not how you necessarily we're two people who are very aware of the structure of these subconscious strategies and have also worked together for let's say 13 years mm. are still working on their stuff um, but it's not an example necessarily of what one should expect if one was to Skype us for an appointment or a session mm. and yet it can be what comes up in a session but it's not a generalized example. Mm -hmm. So when we're having a conversation, and just chuck in if, if you've got something to add, Keith, but when we're having a conversation on Skype, but this is how I mostly do my work now, um, is is that it's it's a conversation where we're attuning to, in this case, the client's way of communicating their challenge. Now, the challenge might not actually be that, oh, you know, I've got this problem. It might be that, you know, they've actually, they're actually wanting to get better at a thing. Mm. You know, it might be that they're yes, really good yes. at golf or throw driving or, 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 or they might be really good in the courtroom as a lawyer, but they're actually realizing that they could somehow they recognize that there's something that tells them they could do better. And so the job of coaching is to also explore better ways of doing things. And I think that's what inspires us to do this. Mm. You know. Oh, yeah. I love the idea that people can tap into their learning again. Yeah. Rather, rather than being constrained to what they think they already know. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. yeah it is. Okay, Keith, until next time. Thank you very much. It's been fun. Pleasure. <laughs>